The Candid Frame is supported by donations by listeners just like you. Help us to bring you great conversations with great photographers. Support the show today with your monthly contribution through our Patreon effort at patreon.com forward slash The Candid Frame or click on the link in the show notes or the website at thecandidframe.com. Thank you. This is Ibarian X, and this is The Candid Frame. If you've been photographing for a while and have gotten to be pretty consistent, you've probably been told, hey, you're pretty good at this. You should do this professionally. As complimentary as that is, earning a living as a photographer is not as easy as printing up business cards and, and waiting for the phone to ring. Because beyond just making good photographs, there are so many things to learn like marketing, writing contracts, finding clients, figuring how much to charge, and, and making sure you get paid. There's so much to learn that it's easy to be dissuaded, whether you want to simply pay for your hobby or actually live the life of a professional photographer. James Maher, a former guest on the show, is a photographer who has managed to figure that out for himself. And though he is popularly known as a street photographer, he is a successful businessman who works as a photographer, an educator, and has created a market for his fine art prints. He's just released a new book called Creative Freelance Marketing, in which he shares all the things that he's learned over the years, and we sat down to discuss the many ins and outs of deciding to go pro. Well, James, welcome back to the, to the Candor Frame. It's a pleasure to, to have you back. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm excited to, to be here. I love Candid Frame. Well, you, you're right. You've written this book on sort of the business and the marketing of, of photography. Mm -hmm. Why did you want to write this book? Because, you know, you, you are a very busy man. You, there's, <laughs> you don't have a shortage of things to do. Why, yeah. you know, why write this book? Uh, it's an interesting thing. I mean, you know, it sounds weird to say, but it was... It started off as a bit of kind of like a passion project because, you know, from the very beginning when I started my business, uh, I knew that I was just going to have to like learn how to market and learn how to, you know, run a small business. And, you know, so I kind of just made that a serious part of my education and learning. And, you know, it's not something that, you know, it'd be great if you could just do your work and get noticed and, and not have to worry about all that stuff. But it's not really the re it's not realistic so much. So I kind of embraced it and over time began to see how powerful powerful it was and kind of in, enjoy it. And so it was really, you know, something that I thought I had, you know, this knowledge that I could share with others. Um, but it was a way to really, you know, take time and, and, uh, you know, reassess my business and fill the holes in my business. And, um, so it was kind of, it was a long-term two-year project to complete the book, but it was also kind of a little self, self-reflective look back into what I've done and where I'm going and, and what I could do better. Yeah. I was going to say that, that, that writing a book about sharing what you know does provide a, a, an opportunity for self-reflection in that way. And you get to see, and you get to analyze what your process is. I mean, I've written a lot about photography, so I have to sort of think about what I'm doing mm -hmm. largely unconsciously. And I have to sort of verbalize it, whether I'm teaching a workshop or writing a book or writing an article. But when you're talking about the business of photography, uh, I can imagine that there's a lot that you learn about yourself, both, both good and bad. When you, as you started writing the book, uh, what were some of the things that you began to realize that you had not really sort of considered that carefully just because you were so busy just earning a living? No, oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, I definitely started with my strengths when I wrote it. You know, I kind of did the stuff that was fun and fast. And then the, the second half of it was starting to say like, oh, I got to write something about this. And while I write, I really have to ass assess it in my business. So, you know, things that, you know, I have been really good at the local marketing aspect, you know, marketing with in my community, working with like local people and websites and blogs. And I, and I was really strong on the SEO stuff. You know, I came from a computer science background a long time ago and, you know, I was able to get high in Google and all that. But, you know, things like, you know, social media was not something I, I'm not the person who's the first to jump to new social media things. And, you know, I'm kind of an introvert by nature. And so social media was something that, you know, I definitely 
had to fill a big hole in. In the middle of this process, I redesigned my whole website, actually, something I've been planning on doing for a very long time. And so it was kind of, th- those were the, there, there were some major holes that I really had to not just, you know, learn how to do better, but I, I had to actually start uh, uh, assessing it in my own business. You know what? I've read a lot of books about the business of photography, mm-hmm. uh, some of which I've learned to apply, some of which that I, I haven't. I think one of the biggest things is that it can seem really overwhelming because there just seems to be so much <laughs> there is that, yeah. that, that what you have you have to do. And I think that as much as so many people would love to be doing this for for a living, one of the things that stops people or or really sort of slows them down is just the idea that you have to wear so many damn hats. Uh, for sure. <laughs> when you think about you know, the person who should do this. I mean, everybody would like to do this, but not everybody is meant to do this. Mm -hmm. So when you think about, you know, yourself and you think about, you know, some of the people that you profiled in, 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 in the book, what kind of person does it take to be successful at, at, at being, not not necessarily a photographer, but sort of a, a creative who's a, also a business owner. Um, it's a, that's a fantastic question. And I'll tell you, one of the things that I was most nervous about when writing this book was that I, I didn't want someone to be like, read it and be like, you know, let me quit my job and just go for it and then throw them down the wrong path. So there's actually a chapter that I wrote in there where, you know, for some people, it, it, it's it might be better, you know, continue to make money with a day job and then grow you know, photography or creative career in a certain way, but it doesn't have to be necessarily your full-time business. It, it's it's interesting. I mean, the, I, I feel like the common thread of the people that go for it and do it are the people who just, they would do it no matter what. You know, it's just that mentality of there's no other option. It, it's just, you know, I'm going to work my butt off at this. And, and it's almost, if you don't, like the people who don't give themselves any other option, you know, they really just force themselves to put their all into it. And that's kind of what I noticed with people I interviewed and things like, you know, it's, there were some who transitioned from different careers and really kind of built their business on the side. And then that was a great way to do it. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, for me, I'll tell you, it was from the very beginning, I just kind of went all in. I, I, I realized early on that I had to do something that I was on my own, that I was interested in to kind of succeed in life. I didn't think I would do well any other way. So I, it, there's a lot of like nervousness behind it. There was, it was just a lot of energy to kind of grow as much as you can each and every day. You know, it's something that, y- you know, you don't really, when you do this, you don't necessarily stop thinking about it. And that that's, can be a big problem as well. You have to learn to do that over time. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I think that's kind of a, a common trend uh, for people who would succeed at this. Yeah, because I think the, the biggest thing about it is that you can, you can be really busy. You can do a lot of things during the course of a day, but a lot of the things that you do don't provide an immediate return. So there's, no, a, sure. there's, a, there's such, there's such room for self doubt mm-hmm. and insecurity. I mean, you can have, you can knock out everything that you have on your to do list every day and, and do so for weeks, but that doesn't, that doesn't immediately result in people knocking on your door wanting to pay you to do, be a photographer. Definitely. And I think that that's, that's a scary place to walk. Mm-hmm. And how, how did you find that you were able to sort of, because you're saying that you don't give yourself any other choice, but mm-hmm. you know, you have those days where you, where you have to just question yourself and just think, did I make the right choice? Do I keep doing this? How long do I keep doing <laughs> this for? How do you sort of, yep. even if you had this attitude of saying, okay, I don't have any other choice but to do this, mm-hmm. but you experience those moments, how do you get through them? So you're not all of a sudden thinking maybe a, a normal nine to five is really a, is a better idea. For sure. Yeah. I mean, that's a fantastic question because everyone, they, I mean, everyone who does this will burn out sometimes, will question themselves. Um, I'll tell you, no matter how busy I get, February in New York, I'm always like, my 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 schedule is pretty empty just because New Yorkers are depressed. You know, no one comes to New York. There's <laughs> So no matter like how good busy, it always drops off in February. And that's, it's an interesting time because it's like, I have to save up a little money, you know, just, I have to like plan ahead. I have to think about it. And then it always like stays slow until the point where I'm just about to like shove a screwdriver in my brain. And then all of a sudden, like everyone wakes up at the same second. And those moments happen and they, they do happen frequently, especially when you're doing long-term things and you're just, you don't know if it's going to work, but you just want, you, you want to grow something in a certain way and you want to play a long, you know, long game. And the thing that I, 
I guess realized early on was it's those moments and, and those the time where you're you don't have any paying jobs that's by far the most important time of your business you know that's the the that time that you have is is what is going to make you succeed and what's going to make all the fun times happen so those times I, I it, it was almost the nervousness and the realization that I had to do stuff in these moments kind of overpowered that frustration or that, that, that kind of feeling. So uh, honestly, I think like, you know, the fear is, is a very, very good thing uh, as long as you don't let it like consume you or, you know, burn out too much. No, that makes perfect sense. You know, this whole idea that when you, when you're having those times in between gigs, that that's the time where you need to be the most busy, even though, you know, it's not going to give you an immediate return. It's like this, these are the seeds that you have, you have to plant. And then you just have to have faith that, that at some point it's going to give you a, a return that you'll be able to sustain yourself. Com- completely. Yeah. You have, I mean, it really helps to, you know, in those times to regiment yourself, uh, because it can be easy to be like, you know, I don't have a job today. Maybe I'll sleep in half an hour. You know, mm-hmm. that that's that's the time where you have to almost think of it as if it's a it's a job where you know you have a boss looking over your shoulder. You have to kind of schedule out your time for different things. And at first, it feels a little weird to do that, but then after a while, it becomes a lot more kind of who you are. Yeah. I mean, a good part of, of, of the book is dedicated to this whole idea of marketing. And there's so many ways that you can market yourself. I mean, you can have a mm-hmm. website, you can have a blog, you can be on Facebook, you can be on Instagram. And a, a lot of that stuff takes time, right? Mm-hmm. How do you sort of ba- you know balance doing all those things on top of, you know, networking in person and, you know, this, how do you sort of, what's the best way to sort of organize your day or your week so that you're making the most use of your time rather than having some things like social networking result in being a, a big time suck? For sure. Uh, and that's a fantastic question. I mean, the the first part of the books, so much of what it talks about is that especially when you're like starting a business, like you can kind of grow and diversify. And I, I've diversified over a long time, but you can do all that stuff, but you don't have to do it all right away. I think the most important thing, to be honest, when you're starting a business is to like try to figure out those handful of things that you can do right away to make the most amount of income. So, you know, it may not even, you may not right away do any internet marketing. You know, you pr- you need a website and you need that stuff, but you know, you could spend the first few months trying to make as many local connections as possible. And it might be worth it to just cut out everything and focus 100% on that until you get that under your belt. The book has like kind of all the different ways that you can grow over time and different things, but mm-hmm. it, it's trying to te- it's trying to say at the same time like you have to know all this stuff that's out there, and then you have to pick the ones right away. Like make a list of the ones that you think will have the most success for your time at the beginning, and then once you get those under your belt, once you're starting to make an income that's sustainable, and then you can start to think more about growing and, and spending more time on different things. Something like social media, you know, social media, uh, unless you're, you know, paying for advertising, that's a way that you connect with people that you've already reached. Uh, and so many people say like, you know, oh, I want to market. Uh, I heard you have to get on Facebook and do this stuff on Facebook. It's that's like down the road. You know, the first steps are really, you know, reaching a handful of people that can really help you out. And, and you know, one of those things is your personal network, you know, who you know, who the people you know, who they know. That's that's for everyone. I say probably that's the first step to really get the most bang for your buck with your time. And then you can kind of go from there. That's really an excellent point. It really is good old fashioned personal time with people networking on a face to face basis, at least to, to build your initial clientele yep. and then, and then using sort of Facebook and Twitter and the emails to sort of, sort of sustain those relationships because you want the return business. You don't just want that one time. But one of the things that a lot of people have difficulty with, especially when it comes to to face to face and, you know, calling people on the phone is this idea of being a feeling comfortable selling themselves. And artists are notorious for being very uncomfortable with doing that. There are, there are, of course, the noted exceptions of people who, you know, (laughs) who love selling themselves as much as they like making photographs. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a certain awkwardness about it, at least to begin with. How do people sort of get past that idea of not being apologetic about wanting to earn a living with a camera? And that's an amazing question because I think that's probably that 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 thought is probably what stops so many people. 
and I'm an introvert. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm more social, but I, I still, it's, it's, you know, the, uh, meeting and talking to people for the first time that I've never met before still makes me uncomfortable, uh, every, every single day. Uh, and I have to fight through it. You know, the thing is that it's, I mean, so it, it, there's like this romantic idea of the artist is supposed to be starving, is supposed to live this weird life. But that's, I mean, I think that's, it, it, when you think about it realistically, that's that's ridiculous. You know, what we do as artists and creatives, it's valuable, you know? I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's worth saying that without this stuff, you know, life would be a lot more boring. And so I think, first of all, you have to realize that, uh, people have to realize that that what they do, it's it's a value, it's a service, it's it's something that that is worthwhile. And then, just the fact that if you don't sell yourself, if you don't, you know, put yourself out there, it's not going to allow you to continue to do the stuff that you love to do. And so I think it's kind of more getting in people's head that you don't have to be that sleazy person who's selling yourself. If you're already having doubts about it, it probably means you're a very good person, but you can still put yourself out there and sell yourself. And, and it's not, you know, it may turn off some people. Some people just may not want to hear from anybody, Mm -hmm. but that's, that's a small percentage. I mean, you know, you're honestly, by doing this, you're actually going to make some good friends and, you know, uh, good connections. Um, I, you know, for, I, some of, very close friends, some people that I work with all the time that I'm, I'm very close with started with me sending out a, like kind of a promotional email or, or giving an introduction. So yeah, I think it's, I, I just, I think it's a lot like just realizing that it's actually not a bad thing and it's every single business, no matter what you do, it's necessary in it. And for some reason, artists have thought that they, that, that it's a really bad thing if, if they do it, but it's, it's not. You have a, a great story in your book uh, of someone asking you what you did for a living Oh yeah, and, and your wife sort of checking you after she witnessed what you had said. Could uh, you share that story with us? Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I, a lot of the stuff that I do now that, that is really, you know, the good practices and uh, have been because, because of my wife, she's a, just, she's a completely different field, but she's just amazing at like, you know, networking and doing all that stuff. And it's been really good for me. You know, I felt that way. Like I was, we were in a, a, a I believe it was a party or hanging out with friends and I, I was talking to someone and I, I forget now if it was someone that I, that I had known or if it was like a new person and they're asking what I did. And I kind of just like felt in me like that I didn't want to promote myself. So I just kind of spit out like, oh, I do photography like quickly and, mm-hmm. you know, change the subject. And a lot of people, it's, I think that's something that a lot of people do all the time. And the, so later on then, uh, Sarah, like, you know, pulled me aside and was just, you know, like, what the hell was that? Like, you know, you're a great photographer. Like, you know, you shouldn't, you, you know, you shouldn't kind of demean yourself by just kind of spitting out, you know, I do photography, like, you know, tell, tell them what you do. It's really interesting. You know, I didn't realize how I was coming off at the time. You know, you don't think about it. You just think like, oh, I'm just having fun. Uh, But it made me understand that, you know, even simple conversations like that, like, especially with photography, everybody needs photography in some form, whether it's portraits or this or that. And, you know, simple things by how you talk about yourself just a little bit, you know, you could talk about, you know, just explain your business in a way that's, you know, nice. And I'm I'm sure people want to hear it. You know, it's an interesting career. And so from then on, I really, it took a little while, but I, I got better at explaining what I do. And now it's kind of second nature. Yeah. I think our wives are related. <laughs> yeah. I, I get the same thing from my wife. And, and for me, it's always sort of weird because people ask me what I do and I always hesitate, you yep. know, because I say, well, I'm a photographer, uh, I'm a podcaster, uh, I'm a writer, <laughs> I'm an educator, you know, and it's like, I really hate the question because yep. I'm never sure how to answer it. But I think it also has a little bit of that sort of insecurity in the fact that I'm doing all these things. Mm-hmm. And most people are not used to someone doing all these things. Like I'm a lawyer, I'm a teacher, you know? Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, and I mean, especially for you, like, I mean, there's multiple things. And, and one of them is like, you know, I run this yeah, amazing podcast with creative people. Uh, yeah, it's, it's hard. It's, it's like just saying, I'm a photographer doesn't really explain it at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, are you a portrait photographer? Are you a wedding photographer? Are you a writer? Are you, so yeah, so I, that's, I mean, it's the tough love of our wives uh, is very important, <laughs> uh, especially in, in, in business. I think it helps out a lot, but yeah, it's, you gotta, you gotta think about it ahead of time. Even if you write it down so that you have it, like, I think that's a really important thing to do. So early on, you know, you were 
working as an assistant mm-hmm. for other photographers, and at some point you realized that you had to sort of venture out on your on your own. Tell us about those initial uh, efforts in order to do that. What were some of the best things you did, and what, what were some of the the worst things that you did? You know, I did. A, uh, there's a couple things. So, uh, you know, I realized I had to s- switch because I wasn't. Uh, I was a little too introverted to be comfortable around the kind of high end New York commercial photography. I wanted to be more one on one and. Uh, kind of create a business that way. You know, I'll tell you the two things that I did right away, which worked really well was one of the first things was I really worked within my friends and the people I knew. And, you know, I have, I've lived in New York my whole life. I have a network of people, you know, friends and, and things like that. And so, you know, I really contacted just people and I said, you know, I'm, I'm starting this, you know, new business on my own. I'm doing, you know, portraiture for businesses and people and, you know, families and all that type of stuff. And, and that, you know, I really had, it led to a lot of little jobs, but then there were a certain number of people that I knew, whether they were, you know, some were my friends, some were like my, you know, my parents' friends and they really helped me out a lot. They introduced me to a lot of people and just, you know, asking them like if, you know, asking people saying, if you have any connections, you know, please let me know. Um, it, it kind of explains to them that here's, if you, if you know a way, here's how you can help me out without actually being too kind of self-promotional. So that really got me started early on. And then I did a lot of just, uh, I did it right away. I kind of had a feeling that, you know, the internet was how you do things. And I, I, I almost went a little all too, too in on that side right away. Uh, but it worked actually pretty well. So I did a lot of, just building relationships through emails, you know, I were, uh, with different websites around New York, I would just send kind of emails saying, Hey, if you need a photographer, can I do, you know, a certain project or, you know, here's my work. And, and I really, um, started to build up a, a list of people who knew me and that led to other jobs. You know, I got a job, uh, for the daily news through someone that who ran a blog, who I just contacted to asking to work with them. And they introduced me to this person, and quickly, within a couple of years, my SEO raised really high. And so for like terms like, you know, different New York kind of related terms, I, I started to get a lot of business, a lot of print sales and things like that. Um, so it was kind of a, t- it was a two edged sword, definitely. But without asking like my personal con- uh, connections right away, I would have still been assisting. So how did you market yourself as a, as a photographer? Because one of the things that photographers initially do is that they'll, I can shoot everything. Exactly. Yeah. And that isn't necessarily a great way of selling yourself but you know you were doing some commercial work uh some editorial work you were selling prints yep. you know how, how did you have to sort of refine what kind of photographer you were and what services that you provide early on so that you weren't necessarily sort of diminishing your identity as a, as a photographer yeah and so that's a great question and i i went a little too diverse at first probably Uh, maybe actually I was, you know, I was still, I was, I was pretty young. So I, you know, was kind of messing around with a different, a lot of ways of doing things, but it was, you know, there was, it was really the portraiture was one thing and the print sales were another. So I had kind of two things that I was hitting. So it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't too much, but it was, I would just kind of promote them separately, but at the same time together, it was, you know, my website had kind of a portraiture section and it had a print selling selling section. And so I, you know, I, to be honest, I, I, I don't know if it confused people too much, you know, the, almost the, the kind of prints and things was a good way for people to kind of just keep up with me. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a good way to introduce it. So they liked that work and some people would buy it. Some people, you know, wouldn't, but it would keep them remembering me. So I think that actually kind of helped a little bit, but yeah, it was, I mean, I think for anyone starting out, like you know, you can do two things like that, but you should, and you can put them on your, you you can have separate websites or you can have the same website. uh, But you want people to know right away that like, these are the two services that I offer and here's who I can help. And here's how I can help them. So when you started reaching out, you mentioned initially that you're reaching out to friends, but a big part of it is reaching out to people that you don't know. Yep. So um, how did you decide who to reach out to? Cause you know, you, you can, people will send out these email blasts to, to <laughs> yep. hundreds, if not thousands of people. Oh, sure. They'll, they'll do some cold calls, but you know, early on, especially if you're doing this part time, mm-hmm. you have to sort of be really efficient with your time. Completely. So what did you find that worked for you in terms of, you know, making those contacts with people that you did not know mm-hmm. that that proved effective? Yeah, definitely. Um, and, you know, I made mistakes, too. I definitely sometimes sent out like, you know, I didn't send out like thousands of emails. I kind of customized them all. But, 
very early on, that was one of the mistakes I made was I played a little bit more of a numbers game with certain things. Mm hmm. Over time, as I've gotten a little bit smarter, and I, I learned pretty quickly, but each you only have one chance at a first impression with somebody, and people don't know you, and you may be the nicest person in the world, you might have great, great work, but you know you have to, especially like people that you really want to get in touch with, you have to be really smart about how you do it. And so what I used to do was I would would make a list of websites and blogs that I wanted to get on. I would research, you know, people who were doing things that I wanted to do. And I would try to find out, find places who had like covered them or, you know, could, I would just try to find out kind of where they were situated. And so I just kind of built this master list that was split up in, into the print selling and split up into the portraiture. And I kind of went down that list. You know, I did things like, like I contact interior designers and art buyers as well. You know, I, con I, I made a whole list and I, I put it in order of like how important people were, you know, kind of how much I wanted to be on this site. And, you know, it was the ones that were, that I really wanted to get on. I tried to be a little bit smarter about it. You know, I, I was sometimes, you know, sometimes you don't even have to, sometimes you can start just becoming part of if it's a blog that you want to work with you just become part of the community you know and you really uh and then over time then then maybe they'll work with you sometimes uh, you, you know you can just send them an email but i think a lot of a lot of it was really how you do that first contact i mean how you craft an email you don't want to write a novel uh you want to be very polite that can go a really far way. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like one thing I say in the book is when you start to make these lists of people you want to contact and people that you want to, go, you know, work with, don't go, you, it's easy to just go crazy and then just start contacting them all. But you want to send a couple, see how they do, see if people respond. And then you'll start to notice the mistakes that you make over time and then you'll start getting better at it. And so it's really, it's a, it's a, it's a big learning process. Let, let me give you a scenario that I think everybody who has tried to do this has experienced. You make that initial contact with someone, yep. right? You, you pitch them the idea, then they ask how much. Mm -hmm. You give them the information and you don't hear back. Oh, for sure. <laughs> so, so, yeah. so, so, so in your experience, what's the best thing to do in a situation like that? Cause a lot of people feel like they don't hear back. And so they just kind of give up. Yep. And, um, you know, and they want to follow up, but they don't want to feel like they're a pest. But, you know, <laughs> sometimes following up is necessary in order to get the gig. So, yeah. What's the sort of best practices to, to handle that in a professional way? Uh, I think the first step is just to take a screwdriver and just shove it into your brain. <laughs> this, you know, the physical pain can mask the emotional pain. Yeah, it's that will, you know, that will happen a good amount. And it's okay to follow up, uh, particularly with people who are very busy, might disregard your email, might just miss it, might be too busy to answer. And so it, I, I actually, I will definitely send a follow up. I'll wait, I'll wait some time. I'll wait like three weeks maybe or something like that, mm -hmm. you know, in case they're away or something like that. And I'll just send, you know, a nice email that says, Hey, just wanted to check, you know, see if you got my other email. Sorry, I didn't mean to buy, you know, don't mean to be a bother, but you know, let me know if you were interested in this, just something kind of, you know, for any time I contact someone, I, I want them to know that it's, I don't take anything personal. You know, if they don't want to work with me, that's fine. I think that's, that's something that's very important to do. And, but, you know, sometimes, many times that's just going to happen and you got to just move on. You know, I think you, you definitely want to reach out again. And if they don't respond after the second email, then most likely they might not respond or you, you know, you can try, you can wait a few months and try one last time. Yeah. But, you know, sometimes it's just things aren't meant to be a decent amount of time. If you send another non-confrontational email like I just like I just said like it, it's happened to me many times where people have just missed it or they've been oh I'm so so sorry I'm really busy like uh, and then got back to me after the second email you write in the in in the book about being confident about your pricing mm -hmm. you know and having an understanding of what your you know what your bottom line needs to be each month in terms of income yep and I and I think it's that's a really important point to to, to discuss because I think being photographers, we're often asked to work for free or to do somebody a favor and give them a really deep discount, all of which can sort of sabotage, you know, our ability to be able to earn a living and to sustain this career. T talk about uh, how understanding your bottom line in terms of the numbers really helps you to gain confidence in terms of being able to communicate what your pricing is and communicating with someone that that is fair for both you and them? Yeah, that's a great question. So like 
when anyone starting this business, or even if you have a business and you want to change things up a little bit, the, I think uh, one of the most important first steps is to create a bit of a business plan. And you have a marketing section in there as well. But in the, that business plan, you want to figure out your primary ways of making income. And you also want to figure out all your expenses, your business expenses, your life expenses. And you want to come to a number like how much money do I need to make start a year from now, a year from now, how much money consistently will I be need to make, will I need to make to survive? And then you have to break that down into how much money per job will I have to get, you know, how many jobs do I think I can, I can possibly get in the next year and how many, how much money per job will I need to get to actually survive and, and hit that number. And having that number is very important because it'll show you that if you don't get that number, you're not going to survive. And it get, will give you more confidence in, in actually sticking to your price when people try to lowball you because when especially when you're starting out and and throughout your entire career i mean it's actually really important as you get really busy as well time is your most important as, uh, asset and so if you're doing these jobs it's one thing if it's like an amazing thing that you can use to get other jobs then that's a different story but you know if, if people are just trying to lowball you often you'll be much better off spending that time marketing so you can get the jobs that you want to get you know, that, that confidence and that, that part is really important for doing that, for saying, Hey, maybe this job isn't worth it. Maybe this client's going to, you know, this client seems like someone who's going to just cause me a lot of headaches and they're not paying much. And let me, let me spend the time trying to get jobs. I, I, I really want, you know, you're going to get those emails with people who seem price conscious a lot. You know, whenever I get those emails, I don't disregard the person ever. I, I, I think about them as someone who's not, who doesn't exactly understand everything that goes into it. And so I'll write an email, you know, saying, here's, you know, this is the price I, I know you're, you know, it sounds like you're price sensitive. Here's the, here's my, the price that I charge for this. And I'll explain a little bit of the reasoning why it costs the amount that it does. And then I'll say, you know, you'll be really happy with the product, but you know, I can't really go lower than this. And sometimes they'll just disappear. Sometimes they won't even respond. Uh, that's uh, that's my favorite thing in the world when someone like, you know, you quote your price and they just never respond. But often people will just not be aware of the price and will you know, go for it and be, you know, they'll, they'll thank you for explaining it. And sometimes the price sensitive seeming people actually won't be that price sensitive. <laughs> so Yeah. One of the things I have found works for me is, is, you know, I go, if I give it to you that price, I may be able to do this, but you'll have to have to accept this much less. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to give you everything that you've asked for, for that price. And sometimes when they realize that they're not going to get <laughs> everything that they want, they somehow yep. find it in the budget to be able to pay you what you've asked for. That's uh, that's an amazing point. Yes, it, it, it allows you to show kind of the different levels of service. Uh, and that's important, too, for um, there, there's the the, follow, the kind of extra question, too, is when you're working with someone, sometimes asking what their budget are is a budget is the most important question. And oh, yeah. you, it's, sometimes it's hard to ask that question, but sometimes you can frame it like I offer different levels of service depending on your budget. What are you thinking that you'll have to be able to pay? You know, I can give you a couple options based on that. You know, a lot of the, the pricing is an art form that is really aggravating. The second you think you're you, you've got it down, you someone will throw you something where you're just like, I have no idea how the hell I'm going to price that. And you got to <laughs> pick a number and uh, it can be very aggravating. Everyone has their their their, their worst stories, like the nightmare stories mm -hmm. of one of the worst business mistakes that they've made. <laughs> What's yours? I mean, I have my worst stories of things where I like thought I got jobs and then that that were worth a lot of money. And the last second they went in a different direction. And, you know, I've lost, you know, an eight grand job, uh, you know, different things like that. So those are those are the most frustrating times in terms. You know, I don't know if I have had a necessarily in, insanely big mistake, but I would say probably the thing that I wish I could have had back was early on. I played a little bit of the numbers game trying to get covered. And I, I, some of the first impressions I could have been smart about, I had no idea what I was doing. Hmm. And that, and you really, I didn't understand, you know, they were fine. I, I wrote all like really nice emails, but you know, I should have played a longer game with some people that I wanted to work with. And that was, that's the thing that I definitely regret the most. Um, but I was, I don't know, I was 23 or 24 years old and I, I was, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit smarter than I was back then. <laughs> yeah, might might involve uh, um, mm. not having a signed contract. Oh yeah. <laughs> so and once you've done that at least once, uh -huh. that that's a hard lesson to learn. 
that's you know. did uh did they try not they didn't pay you after or oh it's a long convoluted story it was, it was <laughs> yeah. a real headache and, and not getting paid was the least of it but okay. anyway. <laughs> yeah <laughs> but you know once you once you've experienced the pain that that, that, that is for me it's like whenever whenever i do a job uh it's like i spend more time writing my description of all the mm-hmm. terms yeah <laughs> uh, then i do crunching the numbers in terms of how much i'm gonna you know what i'm gonna offer for whatever price that yeah that and and you're not alone in, in that being like um, I, I would bet you uh, a very high percentage of uh, photographers start doing their contracts the moment that they have a bad experience <laughs> yeah that's something it's you know it's worth seeing a lawyer getting a couple of contracts made up early on just so you don't have to stress about it because yeah. that like I, I i feel the same like the contract thing definitely stressed me out early on until I had some pre-made ones now that I use for everything. Well, part of your business is not just about providing services to, to yeah. clients. It's, yeah. it's about your print sales. Mm-hmm. Um, talk about that part of your business. Cause I think uh, there's some people who are listening who, who are going, well, I don't want to be a working photographer in that I go out and do commercial, yep. commercial work. I just, I like making photographs and I want to be able to sell prints What's involved in being able to sort of begin the process of being able to sell your 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 prints on, online? Definitely. And that's a great question because it's I mean, there's so many people out there who would love to do that. You know, they, they have a passion for photography. They have a full time job that they do well at and they 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 still want to like sell their work. The thing about print selling and there are certain things that you can do right away, which will help, which will be like, you know, after you create your portfolio and have all your marketing materials, you know, things to show people, you can contact interior designers, art buyers, try to find people who work in hotels or in development in your community. And so those are people who need artwork occasionally. And, and so those are, those are people that you can try to build relationships with. But besides that, um, I, I do think of it as more of a long-term relationship building thing um, because a lot of people will like your work right away, but then will not, won't buy it. You know, they won't have enough money or they just, you know, go on to something else. You know, people have very short attention spans. And so I, I think a lot of it is based on relationship building over time. And so I, over since I started, I built up a, a, a mailing list of people, you know, who are interested in my work and it's gotten pretty bit. It's, it's, I'm getting close to about 9,000 people right now. Wow. And it's, uh, it, you know, it took a long time, but I, I built it over time. And I think a lot of it is, you know, you do have to promote your work. You do have to say, you know, let people know that it's for sale, show pictures of the prints, you know, as they're printed out and talk about them and talk about the work. But most people won't, buy things on first glance, they will buy it on the seventh or eighth time. Um, or maybe they'll wait for someone's birthday or maybe, and it's, it's, you want to be that person that they remember when they do need a gift or when they do need something. And so, you know, it's depending on where you live and what you do and, and your whole situation will probably depend on how you meet people. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there are all those art fairs and things that you can set up, you know, you can actually, I I would say that's, I think that's a very good way to go for some people where you actually have your work printed and out for people who are looking through. And if we're in those situations, I would not even try to sell my work too hard. I would try to like get them on my mailing list, you know, as many people as possible, you know, and there's, it's like, what I said before about it's just trying to when you meet a lot of people to explain what you do and and to get them interested and and so it's it's more of a long-term thing uh I think it takes time to develop besides the aspect of like working with interior designers and things like that but I think that's an important way to think about it but how did you determine you know what of your work would be conducive to print sales because you know you can you can like certain photographs that you make but that doesn't necessarily mean there's a market for it completely i mean you have you have like your your landscape you know your urban landscapes that you sell yep. you also have your street photographs and mm-hmm. you know and yeah. street photographs are notorious for not selling yeah uh, at least with respect to, to galleries so it's like how do you, do you figure out not only what which of your images would have value to the buyers, whether they're you know corporate or private? And you know how do you sort of decide? Okay, these are the ones that I'm going to try to push and see if I can get a get a return on them. Uh, for sure, and and that's you know I mean I think the first the first thing if you really want to sell your work is to get the get your ego out of the way a little bit and listen to what other people want. 
the the landscape stuff that I do, I, I love exploring the city. I love going at different times. I love going in snow, rain, and taking beautiful pictures of New York. I, I like the street photography stuff, that, and I find that more interesting. I like that even more. But you're right; it, the the landscape stuff sells a lot more. And there are, are you know, it's weird. It's it's interesting because the street photography stuff is easier for me to get covered on it and it's easy it, it brings people in and they find it really interesting but then they all end up buying the same 10 prints <laughs> so <laughs> okay. you know so there's kind of a, a it's I, I think street photography is is some people actually you know people do buy it it's it's a much smaller percentage but people definitely do buy the street photography prints and they're starting to even more over time as they kind of get to know me and get to know my work and also as the street f- photography prints age a little bit i think that helps hmm. but it's I mean, it, it, it's, I think street photography works really well in books and, and things like that. Um, it, you know, I, I, I do think for people who are selling prints, you should definitely do work for yourself, the stuff that you love and, and hopefully that stuff will sell as much, but at the same time, create some things that people, other people will like that you're, you, you know, other people will relate to and try to figure out what those are because sometimes you'll have a, like, you know, some of my best sellers, I didn't necessarily I mean, I like them, but they, I liked other ones a lot more and then they just started selling. So, you know, uh, it's not, it's, it's not, not necessarily the worst problem in the world to have, but you know, with how long have you been doing this now? You've been working as a, as a freelancer. Um, it's been somewhere about, uh, 10 or 11 years. Okay. So what keeps you sustained in terms of being able to do it over that period of time? Cause mm. Because I've had gigs like for eight years and usually like the last two or three years, mm. it's like, man, I can't wait to get out of this thing. Right. Oh, for sure. You yeah. Know? And even yeah, though you're fun. working for yourself, you can't help but f- experience moments of sort of fatigue at, at what you're doing. Mm-hmm. So, but this time you don't, you know, you can't just walk out the door. Right. No. Yeah. I, it's, yeah, that's, I mean, it's like, it's pretty much like anything. People think, oh, it's amazing that you work for yourself, but it's, and it is, I, I, I love it. But yeah, you're, you're totally right that uh, things get old yes. after a while. So how do you keep it fresh for yourself so that you can, because so, the drudge work is just that, it's drudge work. But when you're in, mm-hmm. if you're feeling that way about what you're doing, it makes it sure. all the more difficult. So how do you sort of Completely. keep your, keep your mm-hmm. spirits up and keep yourself engaged <laughs> so that, that, you know, it doesn't become as burdensome. Yeah, that's a great question. And I have a whole list of like long-term goals that I want to do. Like this book was one of the long-term goals. It's so, you know, I always try to have it and I'm starting to do this more as I'm, you know, as I'm 10 years in, I'm starting to feel that burned out thing a little bit more than I was five years into it. It's, I think doing new things is really important. I think doing personal projects that are, aren't based on any, income or anything like that, just pure passion that brings you back to what you love about photography is really important to do. And that stuff can often be the stuff that helps you get covered for the paying work. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's, you know, I've been doing a long-term project in my neighborhood. It's going on five years now, a history project and documentary project uh, on the people who live here. And then the next step I'm trying, I'm in that point now where I'm looking for something new. And so the next step that I'm working on is um, I've applied with a couple community places around the city to get grants to do um, interview and portrait projects with um, immigrants, uh, given the you know climate of uh, immigrants, or, you know, and, and to try to do something more documentary that might help or you know something like that. And so I I, I think you know a lot of the I. You know, I might sometimes be frustrated with some of the work that I've been doing with the situation with the, you know, the same thing over and over again, but keeping a big aspect of uh, what I do fresh and making me passionate uh, really helps with make me happy with everything. Do you find that the fact that you're, you're so diverse with what you're doing, you're working as a photographer, you know, you're an author, you're, you teach workshops, you sell prints. Does, is it important to be as diverse as that in order to be able to sustain yourself, not just economically, but just like mentally, as far as being a, a sole proprietor of a business? For, for me, it definitely was. I, I can't speak for everyone if that's like the best way to do it. Uh, I think some people I know, they, you know, they have great photography businesses and they do, they just, they love what they do and they, they keep going. And that's, that can be a strength too, because you get so good at what you do. For me, I, you know, I kind of have a little bit of ADD and, and I, I like to, I like, you know, I like to try new things and that keeps that, that for me, that keeps me passionate, uh, 
about what I do. And it also, it's a little bit of a practical thing because the photography, the thing about photography and your own business that scares me the most is what if I get seriously injured? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like the big fear of, so, you know, the diversification is also kind of a protection, you know, the writing, the books, the writing, the teach, like it's a, a way to, just make me safer as well uh, within this whole thing. Well, my last question that I ask each guest is I ask them to recommend another photographer for our listeners to discover mm-hmm. and explore. And it can be anyone, someone you've long admired or someone you've recently discovered. So who would that one photographer be and why? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I, I'm big on the street photographers. I love, uh, I love street photographers and one of my favorite guys is Matt Weber. He's, he's a friend who, and, and he's, his work is amazing, but he is terrible at promoting himself. <laughs> he's, you know, it's, he's, he's got this amazing life story. He was a graffiti artist and taxi driver and saw so many, so much crazy stuff that he just started photographing the city and, and he bought a camera and became a photographer through that and has photographed, you know, from, I think it was the late seventies, early eighties, like till now. Uh, he has some of my favorite work uh, of any photographer alive right now. So I would definitely re- recommend checking him out. And then, you know, some of my other favorites, uh, I love like the New York, like Bruce Davidson and Gary Winogrand are, are some of the classic people that definitely keep me inspired uh, and definitely keep me humble, uh, you know, because it's always like, how the hell am I going to, you know, create a portfolio as uh, big as these guys. Uh, so, yeah, those are my favorites. And where can people go to find out about your book? Um, so if you go to my website, James Mayer Photography, uh, under the book section, it'll be there. It's called uh, Creative Freelance Marketing. Um, if you go to, I also have the URL, if you go to creativefreelancemarketing.com, it'll take you right to that page uh, as well. And you can see kind of everything else that I do. Uh, thank you so much, man. It was a pleasure to talk with you again. Oh, it's always, uh, it's really fun to be on. Uh, thank you. Thanks for listening. And thanks to James for joining us on the candid frame. You can check out his photography and order his new book by going to James's Thanks for your continued support of the candid frame. If you haven't already, please take the time today to write a review in the iTunes store. Your ratings and comments help people to discover the great conversations like the one you heard today. You can also support the show by making a monthly contribution to Patreon. Visit patreon.com forward slash the candid frame, or you'll find the link in the show notes and the candid frame website. Or if you just want to make a one-time contribution to the show, you can do so via PayPal by clicking on the donate button on the candid frame website or in the show notes. Thanks to all who have recently contributed to the show, including Jan Sears, Brian Collins, and Stephen Wolf. We so appreciate it. To access our complete archive of interviews, download the free Candid Frame app, available for Apple iOS, Android, and Windows. Links for each can be found in the show notes and the website at thecandidframe.com. The Candid Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at theothermartintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker, and our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty-free music can be found at incompetech.com. And you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at simply at X. Remember to help spread the word. And this is X, and this is The Candid Frame.